So welcome and good afternoon. Um, today's panel, I'm excited to uh, be here with Dr. Fallon Wilson and Dr. Tracy Morris. So I will start. So approximately 30 million Americans or one in five households lack high speed internet, um, preventing them from fully participating in modern life. Uh, reliable high speed internet is vital to work, uh, learning and thriving in the 21st century. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted what we may, what many already knew, broadband access is not a luxury, it is a necessity. As hybrid work, um, education, and other online services have become the norm, the need to provide the internet for all is imperative. Connecting everyone will ensure that all Americans can participate in, modern, in the modern economy and facilitate inclusive growth. Um, solving complex problems in our cross-functional world calls for students and the workforce to develop and rely on interdisciplinary skills. This is particularly true in the quest for digital equity, which relies on technologists to create the pathways, policymakers to develop innovative solutions to impactful and accessible funding, and digital inclusion advocates to ensure that solutions can be adopted and used by the community. Education between these groups is siloed today, feeding into a fragmented workforce and problem-solving infrastructure. The educational pipeline for the future of digital equity will create passionate cross-disciplinary experts. Our panel will discuss recommendations to produce a workforce skilled in the different aspects of digital equity and bridging the conversation between desperate groups. So with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Fallon Wilson and Dr. Tracy Mars, and I will allow them to introduce themselves and tell you a little more about you know, their work and what they do. Um, I'll start with Dr. Wilson. I was gonna say Dr. Morris, cause she does such amazing work. Um, thank you so much for such um, a good level setting of why we're here. Um, my name is Fallon Wilson. And nationally, I wear two hats. I'm the Vice President of Policy at the Multicultural Media Telecom Internet Council, which is a very long name. Uh, we refer to it as MMTC. It is a 36-year legacy civil rights, public interest technology nonprofit advocating for Black and Brown people um, at the national level for innovation, technology, and telecommunications, and broadcasting and internet. Um, locally, I'm the co-founder of Black Tech Futures Research Institute, where I work in Southern cities in order, the, in, in order to build Black tech ecosystems through our index research and policy work, working with on-the-ground practitioners um, to develop automated futures for communities of color. Um, yes, and that's who I am. I'll throw it over to my partner in crime over there. This way. Chukma, Hachi Chukmata, Sul Chafoat, Lichi Koyisto, Ihu, and Choka Chafa, Holtafoat, and Koni Homa, Chikasha Sea. Hi, y'all. I'm Tracy Morris, and I'm a member of the Chickasaw Nation of Oklahoma, and I'm joining you from Autumn Lands in beautiful, uh, sunny Phoenix. And I'm the executive director of the American Indian Policy Institute, and we are in Arizona State University, a, and we're a college-level unit within the Watts College of Public Service and Community Solutions. And AIPI is an indigenous-led and staffed research institute, and we work to create solutions-based support for tribal sovereignty through examination, exploration, and elevation of issues that are impacting American Indian and Alaska Native peoples. Um, our focus area and expertise is substantively on, on broadband, as you might well imagine, and broadband technology, digital expert, equity, and expertise in tribal telecom communications policy and you know, newly emerging systems as they impact tribal nations. So that is the bulk of our work. And we do policy work, we do research to support that policy work, and then we do capacity building here at ASU. We are not a teaching unit, so... <laughs> <laughs> That's my colleague Karen, who sits on our advisory council. She is, uh, she's the, she's the one that we go to with teaching questions. Although I do teach, I just, I don't have time to teach. We're not a, fa we're not a um, department that teaches. So, uh, and I'll leave more time for us to have discussion and questions. 
Great. Um, well, welcome. So I would like to start off by, you know, we talk a lot about digital equity. Um, and I would like to start off by just asking, could you each define digital inclusion and digital equity? I'll start, I guess. I'm on I'm not on mute. I thought I was. Uh, and I'm snickering because I don't I don't know if we know the definitions. I mean, I think it's still being defined. I mean, it was just last year we were talking about the digital divide. Now all of a sudden you can't call it digital divide because it's digital inclusion and digital equity. I mean, I guess it's inclusion. We've had some money infused and such, but uh, I do think inclusion means we're included and equity means that we've got equitable, we're, we're there in the space in an equal way. I don't think the inclusion's there yet and I don't think equity is there yet, but I think it's what we strive for. And as a solutions oriented researcher, I really am very much about the solutions. I like defining it in this way, as opposed to defining it in terms of a deficit, which is the divide. We're defining this in terms of, you know, what we're aspiring to. It's like a vision statement, right? Digital equity is a vision statement, <laughs> always aspiring. I love that. Um, I love I love how you phrased it, Dr. Morris. Um, I think, of course, we have national organizations like NDIA who have taken on the task of doing some foundational definitions for us. Um, I think of all the ones that, that they have created, I think I like the, this phrasing the best, but I also have challenges with it. It says, digital equity is the solution. Digital inclusion is the work. Hold on, wait, I, I, I messed up. Digital divide is the issue. Digital equity is the solution and digital inclusion is the work. And I was like, that is a concise way of telling um, what we do. The digital inclusion piece to Dr. Morris's point, I do not think we have that. Um, I think we understand how critical the issues are. I think we understand it more so acutely. Those who have not necessarily been doing the work as long as Dr. Morris and I have understood it more acutely during the pandemic. Um, and so you can understand how the digital divide made children. I mean, it's kind of like the myth making now how children were in parking lots and they didn't have devices. And I was like, well, they didn't have devices before there was a pandemic. But I understand the type of anguish we felt collectively as a nation. And so we understand the digital divide as an issue based moment. We understand that, you know, at least for those who've been doing the work, at the, I'm going to continuously say that throughout this whole conversation we're, we're going to have, we understand that digital equity in some ways is pulling off the obstacles that the digital divide has created for communities of color, for women and for other marginalized communities, like literally taking the weights off, giving them access to high speed internet that they can afford or at no cost, giving them digital training that does not say that simple computing is Excel files and not giving them computer science and funding for their school districts to do it, right? And the digital inclusion piece, we are not there at all. Let me tell you why. I know you asked for a definition. It's easier to talk about it in the now, the moment, then for me to give you to Dr. Moore's point, the vision statement of how we're always trying to make it better. Um, when I look at what states are beginning to do now, I have so many worries, primarily because there are so many amazing national organizations and think tanks and nonprofits who are descending on states with recommendations upon recommendations to help guide the planning. But many of them do not have relationships on the ground with people of color, primarily who have been doing this work pre-pandemic. And so we talk about inclusion. I don't even have to be, begin to think about the workforce and the conversation that we're about to have. I can just simply say they're not engaging community organizations as they should. And primarily because community organizations can't scale up quickly in the way that national organizations can scale down. And so my definition for, for where we are and what this is, it is really more about the practice of the now. Wonderful. And then I guess my follow-up to that is really, do definitions matter? And it seems that they do. So. Well, I think, I think so. I, I think so because of what I said before, that the digital divide is a deficit description. And I don't like... I, I shouldn't say not liking is not strong enough. I am adamant 
to describe things in terms of the possibilities as opposed to the deficit. And so I, I like the terminology. So yes, I do think it matters. And I think it matters to have something aspirational instead of always talking about the problem. Yeah, there is still a problem. I'm not saying there's not still an issue, but to be talking about it in an aspirational way of how to solve it, as opposed to as opposed to talking about it as, as, oh, the poor people of color, oh, the poor Indians, they don't have connectivity. Oh yeah, they're standing on that hill trying to get reception. Oh, you don't know how many times I've had that. Can you introduce me to somebody doing that from a reporter? But mm-hmm. so I absolutely think that trying to define something is always refining it as well. So I think it's absolutely important. Yes. It is extremely important. Um, I don't, this question, I'll be honest, I wasn't a fan of these questions primarily um, because I, you know, I want to get into the thick of like, to your point, solution. But if you're going to frame the definition as a solution definition, then I can go with that. I think we need to introduce a new term, though, um, because in my mind, I'm thinking digital inclusion are the diverse workers and practitioners who've been doing this work and they're leading and getting funding to do that work. But the next level for me, once we pull and take off the obstacles with equity, right, and level the playing field, other communities are already running 10 times ahead, even with the boundaries and the obstacles taken off cultural communities, right? And so I'm looking, I'm going to put it out there. I think we need digital liberation. What does that mean? I know. Come on, Dr. Moore. It's digital right decolonization. I'll offer. Yeah, I- <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really, I think you're right. I think I do think of it as much broader. And one of the reasons that right. I was the one that was adamant that we have this question is because I think of digital equity and digital inclusion as much broader. And I think, Michelle, we had that conversation early on about how, I mean, it's not just education in a niche to train people to be equitable. We all, I'm doing equity all the time. Mm. People ask me, oh, are you doing equity work? Hello, everything I do is equity, okay? But I I never step back to define it. But the reality is I think of the stuff that we're going to talk about as everything from on the ground, teaching people how to put in networks and having the the ability to do that to folks doing the policy work and the writing about it. I think it's the whole gamut. I think it should be inclusive, completely inclusive. So I do think about it, I think, in a much broader way uh, than I think my fellow practitioners, only because I think I'm I'm operating in a vacuum as well. We're the only tribal org doing this, this kind mm. of work. You know, hopefully there, there's starting to be more. We've got some other stuff on the horizon, but we're kind of it. So I'm talking to tribal leaders and myself, you know, and my colleagues like Matt Rantan, who was on earlier, or Karen Mossberger, who's helped a lot with our research, things like that. So that's why I was really insisted on we bring this, we bust this whole thing out because I think the act of defining shows where we all are so different. Mm. It's like when we talk about tribal sovereignty in Indian country, everybody has a different definition, every person. And some of them are really wrong, but most of them are right and they are facets. And so I really feel like this is one of those terms that has facets. So- Yeah, and I would definitely agree with you. I think in the work that I've done around digital equity in 18 years, just the evolution of Mm. the the terms from inclusion to to equity in this space has evolved. But what I've also noticed is that as much as I, I think digital equity can be defined by community, by individual communities, by, you know, in this case for my work with, you know, the states, I think it's going to be important that we do put some definitions around it because what I am starting to hear is, you know, these different things and people lumping, you know, inclusion with equity a lot. So I think that that's an interesting conversation. And with that, I do want to ask my next question is, you know, what do these terms really mean to communities of color and marginalized um, populations? Oh, I feel like I am going to be the contrarian on here. Um, What does it mean for more marginalized communities? I believe to what Dr. Morris said that definitions are important, hands down. Defining is important. To your point, guiding the states because they need guidance is important. But I, I don't know if they serve the full purpose of what we need. I... 
I'm just thinking about like even the digital divide and to Tracy's point, the way that we've talked about it, it is so, and I, and also listening to the previous panel, everyone's like, what well, states and cities are unique and everyone has different challenges and we can't evaluate. I'm like, there are some common things that we can say happen within certain states or within certain Southern states when it comes to issues of equity and communities of color that we can standardize practice around. And I think part of it is when I look at an ecosystem of a city to see how it supports black um, tech futures, right? Our tech ecosystems. I'm looking at multiple institutions. I'm looking at K through 12. I'm looking at post-secondary. I'm looking at workforce development. I'm looking at entrepreneurship practices for tech startups. I'm looking at governmental policies. And most importantly, I'm looking at the assets that Black people bring themselves to cities to build their own features, which sometimes I think we forget. We assume that we assume that we have to go bring the knowledge to the people um, or even the people that are on the ground need us to come, even me, me, Dr. Wilson, to come to their city to tell them what must be done. And so for me, when I think about these terms, once again, the digital divide lets us know what the issues are. The equity lets us know how to remove the obstacles to level the playing field with other communities. Inclusion is supposed to mean that people like me leave these discussions, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but the next step is once we have all of that and the playing field is leveled, and once again, other communities are able to iterate on technology and opportunity in Web3 or in the metaverse, right? And I'm still trying to get computer science into high school classes across this country. It's kind of like we have solved the digital divide. We have done the equity, we've done the inclusion, but yet the, the field is leveled, but yet other communities are 10 times still ahead of us, which means for me, we need a different definition. And I know I'm going back, I, digital liberation, I because I want people who are people of color in this country, who are poor, who are working class, to be able to define their own futures. That's the type of digital liberation or digital decolonization or whatever the term is, I think that's what is needed because for right now, those three are not working for what I think the future holds for communities and people who look like me. Dr. Morris, did you have anything to add? Oh, no, okay. that's great. Well said. Okay, as we, we think about creating equitable outcomes and we, we touched on, um, both of you touched on like workforce development. Like when we think about those verticals, like what would that impact would be on digital equity, like on the workforce, which you envision? I think it's gonna Let's be start huge. With Dr. Mars. I think it's gonna be huge. Um, I, I think, they were not doing enough to, well, it's just beginning. This is all just beginning. It's, it's, I know when we were initially having some of these talks last year, it really became apparent that this was evolving into a field, but I see it, I see it in, in a more expansive thing than just a field. I know that um, our university is certainly moving towards um, digital certificate signing and things like that for other types of training. And I think that's an important thing. An aspect is to have capacity building trainings towards uh, facets of digital equity, the things like Karen's doing with um, the digital in, I'm gonna massacre it because I haven't <laughs> I haven't heard the title recently, but I did write, I did do a, a talk for it, but uh, the new program that we're gonna have for us to forget in digital equity. Uh, but I also think it is broader in terms of what we can do in communities. I think this is, this absolutely should be a part of workforce development, whether and that can be the things like um, these boot camps that Matt Rantanen is and his colleague Chris Mitchell is doing. I think it could be beyond that as well. I think the idea of bringing workforce development into this, bringing digital credentialing into this, but also developing the field so that I don't know, I could find employees who who can do the research and who can do the policy writing because I don't even. It's so difficult to find somebody who understands Indian country and broadband. I, you don't get that. I, I have to train to that, but I have to find the right person to get them up to speed on that. But if it was a field, if it was even talked about, or I think of the other aspect, I sit on the board of the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. 
very old organization for um, STEM technologies. They don't do anything broadband. That's why I came on the board is because how is that not something we're talking about at ACES? And we're working very hard to figure out how to infuse that into the programs so that we're making sure that um, it is a field, that it is a choice out there besides engineering or, you know, the other fields that they're working with. A lot of what they're getting is um, most of it's engineering and science, but why is it not talking about broadband and the science? How about spectrum? How about a class on spectrum? <laughs> you know, there's some science for you. So um, I think the opportunities are huge. And as I was excited 15 years ago to have us to, to be a part of bringing this to the table in Indian country as a new field, broadband, now to be talking about creating, you know, being a part of making sure tribes have a seat at the table for digital equity and developing these kinds of programs is huge. It's huge. And we need it because that's how we impact our own communities. Yeah, it comes from the communities and our communities, whether they're tribal or anywhere else, we know our own communities, we know what works in our communities. But we have to have the resources and the folks who even know it's an option to do the work. So yeah, I'm excited about it, but I definitely think we need to be looking at the tribal colleges. We need to be looking at tribal workforce development programs. Um, we need to be getting into the STEM programs. All those things are going to impact this and the policy. It needs to be a facet of, of uh, the Indian law, law program as well. Just a few um, thoughts on that. No, to, to build on what Tracy, Dr. Morris, forgive me. Um, I like to call her Dr. Morris when we're on these things because, you know, we work very hard for our PhDs. Um, in addition to that, to build on what Dr. Morris shared, there are vestiges of a beginning, I loosely what I would call a type of civic tech, gov tech, um, public interest technology workforce that is being built. Um, some of the players in that space would be New America um, with the Net Game Partnership funding their work with their public um, interest technology university network where they're working to help people to understand the complexities of equity technology and future and and that doesn't mean it that goes from broadband all the way over to algorithmic bias issues and primarily they situate in the issues of bias data and algorithms um, which in my in my opinion is a a type of outgrowth of opportunity if we begin like, mapping out what does mobility look like from being first a digital inclusion advocate in a city that you've been doing this work for the last 10 or 20 years. And what does it mean for mobility to move around through either certifications through ASU when it comes to the types of things they're certifying for? Or what does it mean to go in the road mapping to a CIO, a CTO of a municipality? Or what does it mean to help with national policy making in this space? We all know that technology is changing every fashion of every industry in this country, meaning that every discipline, in particular the humanities and the social sciences, should be a part of this discussion on training their students for this new world of work where they will have to interface with critical questions, right, about access, technology, privacy, data, um, and I think we are just at the precipice of doing that, which is why I'm so excited to work with Dr. Morris on our continuing working group um, to work with some of our national organizations to do this, primarily because, you know, Europe is a little ahead of us on this. I spent about two weeks, um, a couple of weeks ago um, at the European Union and also with Great Britain talking about digitalization of countries and what does that mean? And, and, and the EU has just launched their year of digital skills for their member states. I say, isn't that interesting? We primarily have put our money on infrastructure because of the $65 billion, the majority of that goes to deployment types of issues. But they said, we're gonna situate our funding on the individual and on the community. I would love to do a cross country co you know, comparison of what that will look like in the next three to four years. But the point I'm trying to make is, to Dr. Morris's point, we are at the precipice of thinking beyond deployment. And what does it mean now to have a workforce and the human capital 
to keep us going so that as technology iterates, and it's always going to be iterative, that we have the workforce to navigate not only communities, but our lawmakers and our governments and our nonprofits and our civil society organizations to do this. And I think it really will require, and I know I'm probably jumping ahead and I'm just going to say this and I'll stop. It's going to require that we not only have industry, I think we're good at going to industry for help. Let's go to the tech companies. Let's go to the chambers. And I think that they are important and I, because they're the technical and they're the business. But what we have left out of this conversation are community nonprofit civil society organizations that too need to be retooled and professionalized to live in this new world that is being terraformed, I said terraformed, by our tech companies and our governments with technology. Um, and so, and I, and I should also say, because I always have to tell the story of Black history, because sometimes we forget, the reason why we've been having discussions about the notion of like employment and technology is because Jesse Jackson Jr., yes, Jesse Jackson Jr. of Operation Push went to Silicon Valley in 2014 and told them, you let me see your diversity numbers. The Apples, the Googles, the Facebook, like, oh my God. And that is when they started doing their diversity numbers, which have not moved. I think they all average for people of color two to 4% um, globally. Um, but the point is, that this discussion around like equity and inclusion was started by people of color. And I, and I have to always work that in when I can, because we do cultural disremembrance, which also allow us to build plans in cities that don't have people like me leading it. Well, I just, oh, I just have to say, man, the, that idea of thinking beyond deployment, I think that is a really, really important thing. Um, when we're talking about defining digital ed equity, I like that. I like that a lot. You know, we, sh we should we should hash that out, you know, after, you know, at some point when we meet. But go ahead, Michelle, we're here. We're no, that's fine. This is a great conversation. I think that's why when we start talking about de definitions, we start, you know, opening up a whole lot of ways to explore that and why I think it's important who needs to be at the table and who's been sometimes denied at the table, but that's a whole nother discussion. Um, but circling back to some of the things that you've touched on about, you know, it's easy to bring industry, it's, you know, and technologists, we talk about that a lot, but what are some of the pathways for those who have been doing this work for a very long time in community? How do we bring them to the table and especially, you know, making sure that they are the leaders in this space of like creating these plans or, you know, making sure that they're not being excluded from, you know, these conversations. And as you mentioned, being the face that they so often are in communities um, who are really trusted members of the community. So I'd be interested in hearing your recommendations on that. And I can, <laughs> for y'all, y'all keep doing this. But uh, <laughs> oh, no, but I was going to let Dr. Morris go first, but this is, I've said this before, and I just want to go on record of saying it again. I would love, you know, how much money have you spent on mapping? A billion? 10 billion. It's been a bit, how, we have spent a lot of money on mapping. Um, it's, it's, a, it, you, NTIA, y'all you, you know, no, it's a lot of money out there. And I, and you know, we don't, you know, I'm gonna let people think on what they're gonna think about the new map, fine. I would love to see that we spend the same amount of money on doing a digital adoption mapping. Why is that important? To identify within cities, who are the practitioners doing the work in all of our municipalities? There should be a digital map to find this. If this is a thing, and, and honestly, that type of mapping does not cost billions of dollars to do. Matter of fact, if you ask me as a consultant, but I'm about to give it to you for free because I'm on here, ask me as a consultant, how would you do that, Fallon? How would you identify practitioners on the ground so that we have all of the thought leaders at the table to help with our state planning? I would just simply say, I would do a genius grant for each state. Show me your digital future work and plan. If I'm going to give you what? $10,000, show me your plan, show me your work. I would give a micro grants to be able to cess out all the folks on the ground doing the work. 
that's easy. That's, I mean, it's amazing how easy that is, but how challenging it is to get people to see it. You know, I often believe in the adage, God uses the foolish things in the world to confound the wise. We will go around the circle, under the bridge, get all these amazing national think tanks to come into states when the truth is, I promise you, because I believe in black and brown people. See, this is the thing. You have to have a value proposition. You have to believe that black, Latino, Asian, tribal communities already are doing these things for ourselves to know that we exist in the cities. Does that make sense? You have to know that, you have to believe that we care deeply about ourselves and our livelihoods and our families that we would never allow a moment to come that we were not advocating and planning and working for our communities. My challenge is that we don't have people who think that about us. And so they say we cannot find them. We do not know where the churches and the mosques and the temples are. We don't know who the digital advocates are because you have not put the resources to find because you assume because they're not in your privileged space that they do not exist. It's amazing. I, I feel like most of my work I do in this space, even here at the national level, is writing Black people into existence. I'm always having to write us into existence. We are not mythical beings. We are here. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Morris. I'm sorry, Marconi. Y'all, it's, yeah, I'm going to pass the mic to Never Dr. apologize. Never apologize. No, I'm laughing because you're right. You're right. Writing them into writing us into existence. Hmm. Uh, you know, I think that is an important point. We don't know what's out there. And the, the states are the states are assuming this. They're going to assume it. And the folks that and the way that it's developing in some states, orgs are being developed to handle that for states. And they're not going to, they're not going necessarily to the communities. I mean, these that work is hard to go into communities. That work means you need to build a relationship with a community. You're not going to go in there and just say, hey, we need your people and go. You have to build relationships in these communities and people don't want to invest in that way. And and government doesn't, I don't know, anybody that wants to develop that, you know, to but do that the work. the cost of the return is, yeah. I mean, the input is so small to do it, but yet it will always give. Does that make sense? It's it's true, but the return on investment is long in communities because it is relationship built. You know, you don't just go in there and six months later, it's going to be years. You've got to commit to years. And the other thing is, is I mean, with tribal communities, it's it's multiple communities and multiple tribes. There's just, I mean, in this state alone in Arizona, it's 22 tribes, but that's more communities than than just the tribes. And think about states where there's like, Oklahoma, where there's, you know, 38, I think there's 38. I'm, I'm probably getting that one wrong, but it's a lot. Or, and then what about how much are we missing with urban communities? How about these urban clusters? I don't even, I'm not as good at talking about that as probably Dr. Wilson is, but, you know, there's a significant urban Indian population. In fact, 70% of us are urban. So in top of the reservation Indians, we've got urban Indians, you know, LA and New York have the largest populations of Indians in cities in any state. Surprising to most people. I swear they, they always reverse every 10 years in census. So I always, I always wonder if they just move back and forth every 10 years. But I, I think that it is, the investment is not the money. The investment is the relationship. I love that. So as we think about those things and going into community and making sure that, you know, those who are often marginalized, you know, by folks who say, you know, we don't know where they are. We didn't know they existed when they do go into community. One, I mean, this is a, this might be a little off topic, but it's always something on my heart, to be quite honest with you, is how should they show up and what questions should they be asking to really get at what's needed, you know? how they should be using the funding or so that's a question that's, I have. <laughs> no, that's not an off topic question. It is a pertinent question. Um, I think I, I think people ask that question a lot and they're always surprised by what I say because, because <laughs> people don't want to do it. Um, I would say 
when I think about race, see what we don't see digital divide takes away from us talking about white supremacy, right? Um, digital inequity kind of absorbs us from talking about intersectionality of race and gender and sexuality and, and nationism. And we can go down the line, right? So it kind of removes us. So when I say the solution, it always like, well, why would you say that? My thought has always been this. And I am, I hope I'm representing my national organization well when I say it. Um, just give the capital to communities. I mean, once again, it is the easiest thing to do. Develop a process for each city and rural counties to identify those who are practitioners doing the work because they are there. And then figure out a way to get consistent and sizable capital into their hands to do the work. Simple, but people get confounded when I say that because there's like, but how do they know? Once again, it goes back to how you see black women, people of color in this country. Either you see them as thinking, envisioning, beings and, and people who live and breathe as you do. And so you respect them accordingly and give them access to opportunity and resource or you don't think they are that. Once again, digital divide and all these terms take away from us talking about structural racism and stereotypes of communities, right? And so because we have loud, which why those terms are also, you know, we got to go back on them, um, is that you you realize that you're operating with implicit bias against these communities being able to make decisions for themselves, that you have to find an organization to steer the money and to guide their hands when you should be guiding states a little bit more better about what they're doing, especially in the South. I know you as a government person can't say this, but we have to be very clear about partisan politics and how all of this rolls out for communities who look like me. I do not think, and Dr. Morris, you can push back on me if you, if you disagree, I don't know if we'll ever get this level of funding at this moment that we currently have to address these digital inequities or racial tech disparities, whatever you wanna call it, right? And so I, the simple solution is always the simple solution. Foundations should take time and do a digital adoption map of organizations across this country, identifying who they are, where they're located, and then flow resources directly to them to do the work. But to do it, you have to believe that we are valued. That's a really good idea. You could flow that money through the community foundations for each state. And then that state is going to have a some kind of asset map of who, you know, what those orgs are, or at least to get to the people to find the orgs. I think that's an excellent solution um, would be to work with, to, to, to do a digital asset map working with the community foundations in each state. I think that's excellent because you could always flow the money through them to those orgs too. That's how that works. That's a great idea. Um, or even or even in addition to that, with the community foundations, but also local organizations that we work with who could also be a counterbalance also to community foundations who sometimes don't always see us. But yes, that's all I want. That's a that's a definitely an easy that's a that is a good solution. And that counterbalances the state having all the control over deciding the areas as well. Because not every state is going to do the con the 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 work. I know certainly with tribal communities, you know, we are tribal nations. And as part of the family of governments of the United States, we've always dealt with the Fed first, the federal government first. And states often ignore us because they're like, oh, you know, they're getting they're they're dealing with the Fed. So now this new process by which it's getting administered through the states, uh, by they don't have a working mechanism, most states for working with tribes. They just don't. They don't. The federal government has tribal consultation policies, but there aren't state tribal consultation policies. There's a real problem right now with this. In fact, I do believe that 
this week at National Co- Congress of American Indians, they're discussing the, one of you know some of this as as an issue with states administering the money. Um, we've seen it not work with with library monies in the past and such. So that idea of community foundations as being a counterbalance to the state administering all the money is a is a really great idea that would work for tribes as well i think because we are on their radar a lot of in fact tribal nonprofits in, at least in this state and in new mexico they have affiliations with the community foundations so like the hopi foundation works with the arizona community foundation and and for example and and that that is a really great counterbalance to the state administering everything Right. And and I would also add, because, you know, I'm a little excited about the European model, the European Union. I'm about to keep saying that um, they also have a, a bill of rights for digital like like digital citizenship. Wow. Just let that settle in that there are just things that are going to be guaranteed for their member states. Um, but OK, I will stop there. Don't get ahead of yourself, you know. <laughs> You think it maybe it'll be done and you speak it into fruition. <laughs> um, I will go to the chat just quickly. Um, there were two questions um, uh, regarding the certificate program. One, will there be a cost to the certificate program? And then um, how can how can we get more companies to do this? Um, kind of um, participate or create, you know, boot camps, something similar to what we're saying with the, the tribal boot camps. So on the digital certificate program at ASU uh, in partnership with Marconi, I don't know the answer to that. I would reach out to Karen Mossberger, who was on the previous panel. She would know uh, for sure on that. Uh, presumably somebody at Marconi does as well. Uh, as far as the um, boot camp idea, gosh, I bet. Dr. Wilson can agree to this. How many times have you done this great project? It was like a boot camp. Boot camps work, but they get funded once or twice and then they're done. Because there's not enough ROI for the companies investing in it. Or we're not quantifying the ROI in the way they need. So um, yeah, boot camps, uh, those kinds of intensives work really, really well. And they get funded and there's great ideas. There's replicable ideas, but... Uh, in my experience, after a couple of funding cycles, they go away because the companies don't have a quick enough ROI. T- impacting 12 or 15 or 20 people a year isn't enough money for the amount of investment it takes to create a really quality boot camp. Um, we need to so- find a solution because those those things work. And maybe that's where the foundations need to plug in more commitment, longer term commitment and be thinking about and you know endowing or institutionalizing some of these programs or maybe they work with you know communities to set them up i don't know what the answer to that is but boy right. i've seen some really great programs go go bye bye after a couple of years and it's really sad and that is why dr morris you know i agree with everything you just said funding is episodic for communities of color once the mandate and the crisis is over often is the funding. I, you know, I mm, absolutely once the crisis is over, so is the funding, which is why this, this, this billion dollar infrastructure money is so important because it can give us a little more time and a little more um, way to do the work. I would venture to say there has to be a conversation and the working group that Dr. Morris and I are leading Um, for developing recommendations for workforce development professional, you know, pipeline for the U.S., two women of color are going to do this, um, is that we have to talk with the workforce boards in the states. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to talk with state broadband leaders. We will have to be able to talk with our crediting bodies, our regional creditors. We would need to talk. It's like a it's an all hands on deck moment here. Um, if we're going to have sustainable funding, not just for the boot camps, I would like for us to pass Congresswoman Barbara's Lee um, computer science for all across all 50 states, including DC and Puerto Rico. Why? Because it guarantees computer science courses and funding 
to every child that attends public school. Can you imagine what that would look like if we actually had that? I mean, once again, simple things, but become fodder in partisan politics. And so when people say, well, go to companies, well, co how do we get companies? They are there doing it. But to Dr. Morris's point, it's not a return on investment. Well, what about foundations? Foundations have five-year cycles for how they fund. And so you realize when you have like generationals of inequity and, and generations of wealth gaps, where does the funding and the capital come to support communities of color in this country? I don't know. I am in my, I am deeply in my soul today. This is interesting. Um, come on, Michelle, what else we got? Well, we only have one more question because we have only two minutes left. So this is more aspirational. Um, so in, in five years, what impact will infrastructure and digital equity funding have on the workforce? I will start with Dr. Morris. In five years? Five, hmm. maybe 10. <laughs> but I was going to say 10 sounds a little bit more. Um, I think in five years, I would hope that we have, well, I know in Indian country, we'll have some of these networks built. And so I think that that will change access um, for our communities at the very least. But I think to have generational change is going to take 10 years, you know, I mean, and who's going to quantify it? It's all going to look better because we don't have a way to quantify it, right? <laughs> <laughs> there is that. So it's all going to look better because we won't be here. And they'll be like, look, it's so much better than those people talk about it 10 years ago. <laughs> but um, no, I think that I think that the very the first networks are starting to come online in Indian country with the 2.5 window that was open in 2020. They're building off of those to build some of these newer networks from the NTIA money that started to be starting to you know deploy. I think we're going to have in five years some infrastructure, and I think down the road we once a generation has passed, you know, think about these you know these digital natives when they actually have real connectivity, and we can we have a field that they can go into. I think that. It has to impact change. It has to. But I, I'm not uh, sure I can see what it looks like yet at this point. But then I never thought we'd have the kind of financial investments and in infrastructure mm -hmm. for our communities that we have now. I never in a million years thought of that. So maybe it's hard for me to um, to think that aspirationally because I'm used to not thinking that aspirationally. Does that make sense? Yes, I understand. That is... Dr. Hmm. I, I was just thinking about what Dr. Morris just shared about, because we know the history, right? I am I am a woman of history, you know, I always try to look back. It's Sankofa will be the term in, in, in Dinkra, the symbol of the bird with the the nut in the mouth looking mm -hmm. over its shoulder back. And the in the adages, you have you cannot go forward unless you look back, right? And so you asked me to look to be a prophet to look into the future, to see five, 10 years, um, I, I, I'm often stuck in the past, primarily because we don't do history well in this country. And, and if I had to operationalize what I meant by that statement, it probably goes to the, the previous conversation around evaluation and methodologies starting now and how we are tracking and developing a methodology that will show transparency on how these processes are being rolled out in real time. This, we have the most, I often, I have to say this, we want to be on the moon, we want to be on Mars by 2030. We want cars to drive themselves in the next five to 10 years. We are hoping to have intelligent AI the next 20 or 30. These are huge phenomenons that we have invested billions of dollars and thoughts and dreams into. But when I say to do a digital map, identifying organizations across this country who do this work, or when I say develop a methodology so that NTIA, I'm gonna pick on you now, um, so I can know which organizations states are thinking about working with, and you could just make that transparent to me to be able to assess I don't, it's hard for me to think about future when I can't get simple things in this moment that don't cost a lot to do, 
but and then I began I put on my political theorist hat and I'd be like, do they really want the change to happen in the ways that Dr. Morris has just shared in the next 10 years? Because it, it because I can't envision 10 when I can't because we're Yeah. I yeah. don't know what else to say. I I hate to say that because I'm a dreamer. I am a dream. I dream big for women and girls and people of color. I believe we are future. But if I have to look at the current like data of what I'm seeing as I talk to state broadband leaders, as I work with national organizations, as I sit and say, they don't go with this consultant. They- oh, I we are not doing well. And I think political politics get into the way of doing right by people. And that's probably what I've learned from being in D.C. the last year and a half. I've only been here a year and a half. Um, And it's unfortunate, but I I have hope. I hope that in 10 years from now that we have thriving tech ecosystems across this country led and co-led with people of color. That's all I'll take. I mean, that's all I would like. I would like to be able to see that we have representation making these critical decisions, even if it doesn't reflect the way that I think it should be. Um, but I, I don't know if we can get there because right now the source material, because I'm like NTIA, I'm going to pick on you again. Um, it's not you. You are the proverbial NTIA at this moment. Um, who applied for what? Why haven't y'all released the HBCUs, you know, community pilots program? I need to know which HBCUs apply so I can support them and support you on the back end. Easy things, but political. They're all political. I get it. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Yeah. Okay. No, I appreciate your candor. And I love NTIA, Angela, everybody. I love y'all. Y'all know. <laughs> We can feel it. <laughs> no, I hear you. I appreciate your honesty. Um, but before we end the panel, I just want to give an opportunity for you all to, you know, just any parting, you know, words of wisdom, things that you want to say before we end the panel. I just want to say thanks. This was a great opportunity. And um, to be on a panel with women talking about digital, <laughs> women of color talking about digital. Wow, that's bold. <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. And, you know, we aren't talking about people of color, people of color things as much as we're talking about big solutions for communities. And I love that we're solution oriented. So thank you for the opportunity. I just want to say to build on Dr. Morris's point, I also want to give a shout out to Samantha, um, the former executive director who saw the need to bring on people of color into this. It starts with good allyship too. Should I, should I, can I say that? Um, in building out these on ramps and to ensure that, to your point, um, Michelle, that we have people at the table who can advocate. And so perhaps I will amend my statement slightly about 10 years. Being able to work with Dr. Morris and, and you and Angela and others in this space it gives me a modicum of hope. Um, and so so thank you for the work that you do. And thank you, Dr. Morris, of course, for the work that you do for your community. That say thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Thank you, Dr. Fallon, for today's panel. This has been such a great conversation. <laughs> We'd love to continue it offline, actually. <laughs> um, and with that, we'll end. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye.